Happy Halloween and welcome to the October edition of Region ZMS Update. We were supposed to be having a work party in Dr. Frasconi's basement. I don't see anyone else around here. I'm going to go walk around and see who I can find. Just kidding, we're actually coming to you from a haunting experience in Cottage Grove off of Highway 61. October 31st has had many different meanings throughout history. The first time this celebration was noted was when the Celts celebrated a festival called Sowin, which marked the end of summer, a very important time for those who depended on plants. It was believed that the spirits of those who had died in the previous year roamed the earth on this dark night. Fast forward to the United States at the beginning of the 20th century. Various European immigrant groups, most notably the English and the Irish, brought all of their customs and traditions over, which have melded into our current celebration. Interesting fact, because of the rampant vandalism, or merrymaking as they called it, during the early celebrations, the focus was shifted to more of a children's celebration, which is where we get our current trick-or-treat model. This month, we're going to meet the Hope Animal Assisted Crisis Response Therapy Dogs, review what it means when you have an end tidal CO2 value that is low, and catch up from the news desk. So grab a cup of hot cocoa and hang on to your socks, because coming up are the three things you need to know. First up, let's talk about numeric readings when using end tidal CO2 monitoring. We've traditionally used this in cardiac arrest and procedural sedation, but there are many, many other uses for this valuable tool. Our ALS education specialist, Brian Flynn, is going to talk about low end tidal CO2 values and what that potentially means for you as EMS professionals. Take it away, Brian. Hi, my name is Brian Flynn. I'm an ALS educator with Regents Hospital. Today we're going to be talking about end tidal CO2 monitoring. You guys are already aware that you use your pulse oximetry to assess oxygenation in your patients. But what end tidal is used for is to assess ventilation, which will include oxygen and CO2 exchange at the site of the alveoli, and to some extent helps us with understanding how perfusion and metabolism is working within our patient as well. If you guys remember way back to high school science classes, for our body to create energy, primarily uses oxygen and sugar, and the byproduct of that is CO2. What our end tidal does is measure that byproduct so we know that metabolism is taking place and that we're appropriately exhaling the amount of CO2 that we should be. And in normal ventilation for a patient that's doing well, we should expect a number between 35 and 45. A new study came out that says that your smart cannulas can read from 30 to 43 as being a normal average span. One of the suggestions they make to get higher end tidal numbers with the nasal cannulas is to make sure it's actually inside the nair rather than hanging below the nair, and you may find that you have a slightly higher number. There are things that are going to increase CO2 in your patient. This is anything that involves the patient needing to use more energy. This could be a patient that's hyperthermic, could be a patient that was just seizing, could be a patient that has a fever and is starting to shiver. All those could cause an increase in CO2. On the other hand, you're going to have things that decrease CO2. A patient that is hypothermic, a patient that isn't breathing, a patient in cardiac arrest, all of those will decrease the amount of CO2 the patient has. There are two forms of respiratory failure that we should discuss really quick. One involves slow breathing. So imagine you show up, you have a patient's laying on the ground, you see them, take one nice breath, and then as you sit there counting their breaths, you realize, this is kind of taking a while. There we go. As the patient breathes in too slowly, the CO2 starts building up in the lungs, and with every breath, they have a higher amount of CO2 that they're exhaling. 
As your end tidal raises above 50, it's good for us to recognize the patient already has respiratory depression, even if their oxygenation is currently at 100%. Beyond that, once we notice end tidal gets up to the 70 to 80 range, that patient is in respiratory failure. We need to uh, get in there immediately and start breathing for the patient, preferably before their end tidal gets to 70, but we don't always have that opportunity. Understand that once the end tidal hits around 80, patients will usually stop breathing altogether. On the other side, we have shallow breathing. So they might be breathing at a normal rate, or they might be breathing a little too quickly, but you won't see a lot of chest rise or chest movement. When you listen, you'll have diminished sounds in all fields because the patient isn't moving enough air. And what we see on end tidal is that the end tidal consistently decreases. If they don't breathe in deep enough to actually cause exchange of CO2 and oxygen at the site of the alveoli, they just move air from here in and out. And what we see is it's more dead space air that gets moved instead of the patient appropriately ventilating. So as end tidal drops below 30, the patient is in respiratory depression. Again, regardless of what your pulse ox says. As they go to about 20 to 10, that patient is in respiratory failure. And below 10, they not only stop breathing, but they're likely to go into a cardiac arrest due to the severe acidosis, the inability of the patient to breathe out that buildup of CO2 that's now circulating through their body. Your end tidal can be used for things besides just respiratory problems though. One of the things that we can use our uh, end tidal for is assessing if a patient is hyperglycemic versus DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. Our real goal is to tell, is this a patient who has a blood sugar over 550, or is this an, uh-oh, patient is acidotic. If you toss on your end title and the patient has an end title above 35, we can rule out DKA acidosis 100%. If, however, the end title is at 29 or below, it's a 90% chance the patient does have DKA, and below 21, it's a 100% rule in. It seems counterintuitive, as a patient becomes more acidotic, I would think that their end tidal would increase. But what we set have to realize is the normal breathing pattern for a hyperglycemic patient. They breathe very rapidly and they breathe very deeply. And what they do is they breathe off all that respiratory CO2, so you see a decrease of it, and the goal is to get the uh, acid out of the body, but we're ineffective in doing so. So our CO2 decreases even though our metabolic acidosis is increasing. If you have a displaced tube, you'll end up having a normal waveform that will slowly drop off. What we have to look for is this dope mnemonic. So I'm bagging a patient and I notice my end tidal drops to zero. The first thing I'm gonna do is have a partner go ahead and assess lung sounds, and we're gonna assess chest expansion. If I have good, equal, clear bilateral lung sounds and I have good chest expansion, it's probably an equipment issue and I would just switch out my end tidal reader. If on the other hand, I squeeze the bag and I no longer have air movement at all, I probably have a displaced tube and I'll need to go ahead and re-visualize and either re-intubate or use a BLS airway for a little while to re-oxygenate and then attempt intubation again. Other possibilities, you could have an obstruction at the end of your tube. You can go ahead and suction inside the tube, and if that doesn't clear it, go ahead and pull the tube and move to a different airway. The other option is a pneumothorax. What I would have you guys recognize is that you should have lung sounds on at least one side if it's a pneumothorax. And the other thing is your end tidal shouldn't drop to zero. It'll just be lower than it was when both lungs were expanding appropriately. We can also use end tidal for our trauma patients. They did a cohort study. They looked at 170 pre-hospital trauma patients that were brought in. They said, is there anything that we can look at to determine if the patient is likely to be uh, needing immediate surgical intervention and a blood transfusion? And what they showed is only 14% of all patients that needed immediate surgery had a drop in blood pressure below 100. On the other hand, 82% of those patients had what they referred to as an abnormally low end tidal, which was below 30. Now I want you guys to keep in mind, a normal or high end tidal does not rule out severe trauma, but a lower end tidal in a trauma patient should rule in severe trauma, and we should consider rapid transport and potentially get in a stay room or TTA as appropriate per how the patient is responding. Final thing I wanna talk about is the sepsis and SERS criteria. 
SIRS is Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Sepsis is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome that also has a likely or known infection related. You can see in the blue what the signs and symptoms are. High or low temperature, heart rate above 90, respiratory rate above 20, or a low end tidal, or a white count if you happen to take the patient from a clinic or they have recent blood draws for you. What I want you to recognize is that you only need two out of the four criteria to call this SIRS, and with a likely or known infection, this becomes sepsis. They did a large study to determine if end tidal can give us any additional information. What they found was an end tidal below 25 is equivalent to a lactate level above four, which in the hospital is considered to be septic shock, even with an okay blood pressure. What else the study find out is that if a patient is brought in by EMS and we don't inform the hospital we're concerned of sepsis, it took on average 122 minutes for the patient to receive IV antibiotics. When we came in with a differential diagnosis of sepsis and vital signs and end tidal to match, patients got IV antibiotics 52 minutes faster than the patients where we did not provide such a story. So just make sure that we can recognize things like sepsis and SERS criteria and that we can inform the hospital of our concerns when they arrive. It's better immediate care for your patients. Have a good day. Next, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Let's head over to the main Cottage Grove Fire Station to meet with the HOPE Animal Assisted Crisis Response Therapy Dogs. This is a group whose mission statement is to provide comfort and encouragement through animal assisted support to individuals affected by crisis and disasters. I think this will be kind of fun. Check this out. Hi, my name's Laura Frucci and, and I'm Lisa and we are with our dogs, Joya and Ivy. And we're members of HOPE Animal Assisted Crisis Response. HOPE is a national all volunteer 501c3 and um, our mission is to uh, provide comfort and encouragement through animal assisted to support to individuals affected by crises and disasters. The dogs are comfort dogs and they're, they love mm -hmm. to be petted. So contrary to what you think um, with the vest that you can pet these dogs, we're at the end of the leash and the dogs do all the work. Uh, when um, we work to assist organizations and um, first responders were there for you too. And when people need services, they're going through a disaster or a crisis, the Hope Dogs really are that, that bridge that brings them back into their environment and it calms them down, and so um, they just kind of connect them back to what they're going through while they wait for services or information, and they really help to reduce the stress level. We do tornadoes, you know, Flood, floods, fires, hurricanes, fires, and then down to individual traumas, like people who have experienced the death of a loved one, a student death, teacher death, or something. And it's, it's quite um, interesting too, like with schools, well, I've been to a school where there were two student deaths. And so the, the first day the children came back to school, it was a high school, they were quiet. Thank you. <laughs> the first day the children came back to school, you know, they're, they're walking in, they don't know what to expect. They're all traumatized, they lost their friends. It was in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And, and then they're greeted at the door by all these dogs and you could just see the stress level lower. And um, we worked there, we uh, re <laughs> went, thank you. <laughs> there it is, so yeah. Uh, so I just rewarded that, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, I know, I was. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't good. Okay, we'll edit, down. you're fine. And um, when we first reported there, um, we met with the counselors the night before, and so when we are deployed, we work at your direction. So we're, like we said, we're behind, <clears throat> excuse me, we're behind the scenes. The dogs do the work, but we'll work at your direction. And although many of our members are counselors themselves or medical professionals, we don't act in that capacity at all. We take your guidance. What we are doing, you know, we are trained in, in psychological first aid, so we try to identify those symptoms in people and then point it out to our contact at the, at the um, center there, the school counselor or whoever, and work there and let them know that this person maybe needs 
to be seen a little more. And we have continuing education um, that we need to maintain to stay certified through HOPE. Some of our basic requirements are psychological first aid, pet and human first aid. Um, we are trained in the FEMA 100 and we go through the incident command system and we operate in that function on a larger call out when more teams will come in. There's usually one team leader there that works without a dog and their job is to be the point person with the agency that we're supporting and then um, they also watch for stress signs in us or our dogs. And there are seven regions and typically the people who are in that region are the ones who will first go there, but if there are larger call-outs, they put a call-out to all the regions. And in addition to supporting all the agencies or students or staff too, um, we are available to, to help, you know, police, fire departments, EMS, um, and first responders, because, you know, when you have your debriefing after an incident or something, the dogs can come in and, and be part of that too and help you relieve your stress. HOPE members do not self-deploy, and so if there is a crisis or you need our support, um, you can contact us through our 800 number, which is 1-877-HOPE-K9s, and that's K with the number 9 S, or contact us through our website at www.hopeaacr.org. I'm Dr. Peterson. And I'm Dr. Clausen. And this is a Region ZMS update. Now that we've made it through the end of the summer, the State Fair, and the St. Paul Saints championship season, we can finally take a step back and breathe for a minute. So let's use this opportunity to officially introduce our new EMS fellow, Dr. Aaron Clausen. Now many of you have trouble confusing myself and Dr. Aaron Burnett, so we thought it would be a great idea to throw another Aaron into the mix. So Dr. Clausen, Tell us about why you decided to go into EMS, or as we sometimes call it, the beautiful game. Well, I started my journey as a police officer in Tucson, Arizona, where I worked for about five years before medical school. I went to medical school at the University of Arizona Phoenix campus and worked as a reserve officer for Phoenix Police. And then I came up to Minnesota and did my emergency medicine residency at Mayo Clinic. And here I am to learn about EMS from all of you. Excellent. Dr. Clausen is authorized to give online and on-scene medical direction, so hopefully many of you will have a chance to pick his brain in the coming months. Keep your ears peeled for CAR 95 in Ramsey County and 874 in Washington County. I've introduced this project over the last few months, but as a reminder, Regents Hospital is currently conducting a study to evaluate our trauma team activation criteria, which we are calling the Inception Study. We are not asking you to do anything different, just be prepared to be met by a research intern in the ED to have you indicate which criteria you used to activate the TTA. We plan to use this information to refine our criteria in the future. As Narcan has become more prevalent in the community, we've noticed a trend in the past few years. Well-intentioned citizens are administering Narcan to unresponsive patients, sometimes in multiple doses. The nasal spray formulation comes in four milligram doses, so some of these patients are getting a hefty amount of Narcan. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and we want to encourage bystanders to recognize overdose situations and intervene. This does bring up two important points to remember. First, if you are someone who administers Narcan, don't forget that there are other conditions that can mimic opioid overdose, such as hypoglycemia, trauma, or overdose of another non-opioid substance. Don't forget to provide airway management while you are waiting for the Narcan to work, because Narcan may not be the right treatment for that patient. Second, remember that Narcan blocks the opioid receptors. If, for some reason, you need to give an opioid pain medication or sedation, such as fentanyl, after someone has received Narcan, it may not have the desired effect. You should either consider other medications, such as a benzodiazepine, or contact medical control for authorization to give a higher dose of fentanyl than you normally might. By now, most of you who are paramedics have probably been through a critical thinking lab in the last two years since we changed the format. From our perspective, things have gone well, and we feel like we are getting a good picture of each individual's strengths and weaknesses. The guideline exam, however, has raised some questions, especially, especially since we haven't given out any scores or feedback. So let me explain our thinking a bit here. 
We're trying to create a guideline test that is reliable and valid. This means that each question needs to be tested and validated. The only way to do that is by having a bunch of people take the test. What we have found is that if 90% of you miss a question, it was probably a poorly written question and shouldn't be asked to begin with. Despite our best efforts to screen everything, we have identified a few questions that probably shouldn't be on the exam. So because of this, we don't think it would be fair to give you your score because your score doesn't mean anything and you can't even compare it to your colleagues' scores since each person might have had a slightly different set of questions. Rest assured that for now, we are not doing anything at all with the scores except for tracking the validity of our questions. We will give you fair warning when the test actually goes live and you will definitely be given your scores once we are certain they actually mean something. Clear as mud, right? Any questions or concerns, feel free to contact myself directly. And finally, we'd like to repeat a request we put out several months ago in support of St. Paul Fire's Station 51 program. They are looking for donations of gently used EMS pants, boots, belts, etc. that can be distributed to their EMS Academy students. Please consider supporting these future EMS professionals by donating any old uniform items you may not be using anymore. You can drop them off at our office here at Regions EMS and we will make sure they get to the right place. That's all the news we have for this month. Thanks for watching and until next month, I'm Dr. Peterson. And I'm Dr. Claussen. Next, I'd like to give a shout out to our service of the month, Marine on St. Croix Fire and Rescue. This agency covers 4.2 square miles in the city of Marine on St. Croix, in addition to 10 square miles in May Township, just north of Stillwater. 15 of the department's members are cross-trained to respond to EMS calls, and in 2018, the department responded to 51 medical calls in collaboration with Lakeview EMS. Thanks for your dedication. Whoa. Well, thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully you had fun this month and learned something in the process. For Regions EMS, I'm Dr. Peterson. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next month. Hey RJ, what kind of coffee does a vampire drink? Decoffinated! <laughs> yaka, 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 yaka. Hey RJ, why do you think they call this resident soup? Hey RJ, what is a ghost nose full of? Boogers! Ha, 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 ha. Hey, RJ, what's a ghost's favorite ice cream flavor? Booberry. <laughs> <laughs> All right.